All right, we're back with multiple regression, the third lab. The reading for this lab is chapter six from the textbook. We'll just pop over to that chapter and scroll up a bit. This is non-orthogonal multiple regression. After this chapter, we head into the ANOVA sections, which comprise most of the rest of the textbook. Regression and ANOVA are, are related, so we'll kind of flip back and forth between these different ways of thinking about the same thing. And in this chapter, we're talking about regression um, in a non-experimental context, effectively where you have multiple dependent variables and you wanna see how much variation one variable explains in terms of the other. And this chapter develops an idea called the semi-partial correlation. So one of the main purposes of our lab will be to think about how we can use R to understand semi-partial correlation. But before we get there, um, I'm going to focus on a first concept, generally, uh, that's fairly general to understanding multiple regression. Uh, we're going to be using the word explanation throughout, and we're going to use this word in a restricted statistical sense. We'll be dealing with linear models. And so here, explanation is, um, refers to a geometrical account of the data. And, you know, if you think about scatter plots where you've got some dots up there and you've got an x-axis and a y-axis and you draw a line through it, when we talk about the line explaining the scatter, uh, we are thinking about describing each of the dots as um, one part that falls on the line. Uh, that's the explained part and a leftover part that doesn't fall on the line, the unexplained part. So we'll use explanation in that sense, uh, something like how much does this line capture the dots? Um, and we won't use the word explanation to refer to other things like um, a process account of, of why the dots are the way they are. We're just simply talking about whether uh, a line can explain some of the variation. All right. You might have read in the textbook or heard this somewhere about multiple regression. Um, in the context of multiple regression, uh, we can think about R squared as a measure of how much variation we've explained in the data. And we've learned about that concept when we talk about simple regression. With multiple regression, we get multiple predictor variables. And so we can keep adding these variables into our model. And there's this thing that happens when you do that, and that is R squared will grow. And I, I just want to show you a kind of strange example here. And it's gonna focus on this idea that in multiple linear regression, as you add more predictor variables, you will generally increase the amount of variation explained. So we're going to do this for completely random vectors where there's really nothing to explain. Uh, let's flip over to R. And I just want to make some random numbers. So I'm going to use R norm. And you know, there's a bunch of random numbers that I made. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put them into a matrix. So here we have it. Uh, let's look at this matrix. There's uh, 26 columns and 20 rows. So every one of these numbers is randomly generated from a normal distribution. And it's totally random. You know, we would expect that the variable two and variable one are unrelated to each other because of the random sampling. Just to make this easier to look at, I'm going to name these columns A, B, C, D, E, F, G, all the way to Z. And um, let's put them into a data frame. So it's basically going to look the same here. Looks like a data frame. So let's consider what we've done in terms of the concept of orthogonality. And what we've done is actually made 26 different column vectors of length 20. And these variables are orthonormal in expectation. 
the idea is we expect that because we randomly made these numbers, uh, the values in A should not be correlated with the values in B. Why, why should they be? There's, they're just random numbers. So let's find out. Um, what we can do is use the core function. This one will give us a correlation matrix. So let's check this out. Here, so this is a pretty big matrix. Actually, we can keep looking down. But let's look at the top part. And what do we have here? Uh, all right, w what we have is A correlated with A. If you correlate A with A, you get a one because A co correlated with itself, it's, it's exactly the same vector. Well, what is the correlation between A and B? That correlation is 0.14. So even though these are random numbers, there randomly is a 0.14 correlation there. How about A and C? That's 0.11. How about A and D, 0.3? You see all these correlation values. And by random chance, that's these are the values we're getting. Every time, you know, if I uh, redid this whole thing and then recomputed these, the correlations are going to be totally different all right, because it's all random. So we get some correlations by chance. Uh, but at the same time, on average, the correlations should be zero. So if we look at a histogram of all of these correlations, we can see that they are distributed with a mean of zero. Um, notice there's a bunch of ones over here, but that's just that diagonal where everything is correlated with itself. Okay, fine. We've made some random vectors, 26 of them, and they on average have zero correlation with each other. So this is what we mean by they are orthonormal in expectation. On average, they're uncorrelated. Okay, let's do something. Let's try to predict the values of A from the random vectors in columns B to Z. So let's pretend that A is something that we measured, like some dependent variable, and B is a predictor variable. We wanna see how much variation in A is explained by variation in B. And you know we know that everything in A is a random number and everything in B is a random number. So on average, B shouldn't explain anything about A because they're completely uncorrelated in expectation. Let's run the linear regression anyways. So we've got our uh, formula here. We're gonna use A as the um, dependent variable trying to predict it as a function of B, you can run that linear regression. And what we're interested in here is this multiple R squared. Now there's only one predictor variable, and we could see that the R squared for this predictor variable is 0 0.02. That's like saying it doesn't explain very much of the variance, right? And only 2% of the variance. And um, that's just a, basically a, a random chance thing, right? It's gonna explain a slightly different amount of variance if we resample all of these numbers and change all the values in A and B. So let's try that. So we changed all the values there. We do this again, and we're gonna get a slightly different value. So 0 0.028, you know, pretty similar, not terribly different. Um, let's try it one more time, see if we get something more interesting. Uh, oh, the multiple R squared here is 0.16. So by random chance, um, you know, B happened to explain more variance in A just by random chance. So we can see that this value is going to fluctuate randomly. Let's uh, play a game though. Let's see what happens when we add another predictor variable. So now here, we're going to try to explain variation in A, not just with B, but with B and C, okay? So let's use both of these and see how much both of these explain variation in A. Now remember, B is random, C is random. Neither of them should explain anything about A. So let's do that. Okay, so we get uh, 0.16. What I've done here 
is um, instead of looking at the regression, I'm just popping out the R squared values. So when I do it like this, I don't have the dollar sign R squared at the end. So I'm printing out the whole thing. What I want to look at is just this number. Because we're going to look at how R squared changes as we increase the number of predictor variables. So let's look at it this way. So it's just giving us the number 0.16. Okay, let's add a predictor variable and watch what happens. Oh, it goes up just a tiny little bit. Hmm. So we added a, another completely random predictor variable and our R squared went up a little bit. You might not think it went up very much. You're right, it went up a very small amount. Well, let's add another one. So now we've got B, C, and D. Remember, these are all random vectors. Oh, it went up again, one, one, seven. Right, let's add another one, B, C, D, E. So now we've got four completely random predictor variables. Went up a little bit more. Let's add another one, F. Went up a little bit more. Let's add another one, G. Oh, it's, it's going up, 0.22 now. Let's add another one, H. 0.238. So there's this thing that's happening. As we increase the number of predictor variables, even if they're completely random numbers, um, as you do that, you increase multiple R squared. And this is actually a, a pretty fatal issue for linear regression in that uh, we can always e completely explain the variation in A just by adding more random predictor variables. And I'm just going to re-randomize all the numbers. And I just want to show you that yeah, this basically happens no matter what the numbers are. So uh, we could start look at our sequence of R squared values as we added more predictor variables. And it goes 0 0.13, 0 0.14, 0 0.25, 0 0.19. 0 so it keeps going up to 0 0.4 this time. So if we re-randomize it, um, here we go. Do that again. The, the values change somewhat, but the trend doesn't change. It just keeps going up and up. Now you might think, okay, 0.26, that's not very much. Well, you know, you don't have to add too many more to get to one, and you will get to one. So let's look at that in one more way. We're going to sort of, I'm preparing you for something you'll see later in the semester. Notice that up here, we've been using the plus sign in our formula as we add additional predictor variables. And this adds each of them separately into the re regression. Down here, I'm changing that symbol. I'm going to use the star sign. And this will include interactions between the predictor variables. So it's like adding B, the uh, unique effect of B, the unique uh, variance explained by C, and the possible interaction between B and C. Um, yeah, like I mentioned, we haven't talked about interactions in this course yet, so I'm not going to go into detail about what they are, but I want to show you a little bit what they look like if we put the dollars, or sorry, the star sign here. Look, let's take a look at the regression. Um, see, now it has a component for B, for C, and for the B by C interaction. So even though we had two predictor variables, there are three l separate linearly independent bases to explain the data. Um, if you go with three predictor variables, let's take a look at how many interactions we have, just to start getting you thinking about the number of com combinations here. It starts like, exploding, really. So we've got B, C, and D. Then we've got the B by C, B by D, C by D, and the B, C, D interaction. So with three predictor variables, you get four total interactions. So it's kind of like having seven unique predictor variables. And um, look at the R squared here. It's 0 0.31, so it's getting bigger. Well, let's go to 1, 2, 3, 4 predictor variables, including their interactions. Now what we get is um, one, two, three, four, a uh, bunch more. So there's all of these 
uh, independent ways to try to account for the variation. Well, look what happened to our multiple R squared. It's at 0.6. Uh, it's going to 1, isn't it? So let's give it B, C, D, E, and F. Uh, how many um, interactions are there here? Well, what we'll see is actually we've broken the model. R, R squared is 1. So we completely explained all of the variation in A just by adding multiple predictor variables that are all random. Um, as you can see, if you're going to count down here, uh, let me just quickly do that. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, right? Um, this is that point where we've included more predictor variables than we have rows of data uh, in the model. Well, just about. So we got, we got to 19. But in around this location is when you're guaranteed to explain all of the variation in your data. If you have more predictors than data, you can do it. So it's something to be aware of when you're thinking about um, the concept of explaining variance with multiple variables. It's, um, you might not be getting the explanation you're looking for just because you got a really high R squared value. Well, you'll probably always get that if you add enough variables. All right. Um, let's do a quick review before we head into semi-partial correlation. In the last lab, we talked about the Slameka design as being a orthogonal multiple regression. And we are saying that uh, in this chapter, we're talking about non-orthogonal multiple regression. If we quickly look at this example from chapter six, um, the dependent variable is right here, memory span, and the two independent variables are age, 4, 7, and 10, and speech rate, 1, 2, 4, 3, and 6. Now, these independent variables are non-orthogonal because as age goes up, speech rate goes up. So X and T are correlated. And we talked about how correlation is an indication of orthogonality. When things are not correlated, they are orthogonal. These two things are correlated, so they are non-orthogonal. So if we think back to the Slameka design, we might wonder, well, how is it that uh, that was not orthogonal? If you remember, or sorry, how was that design an example of an orthogonal design? Now, if you remember, there was a, a variable called original learning, and it had two or three levels, sorry, two, four, and eight. This is the amount of practice you had in these different levels. And there was something called interpolated learning, and that had zero, four, and eight. And if you're thinking about just looking at these values, and thinking, oh, well, how would I know if um, original learning is correlated with interpolated learning? You might do something like this, like just compute the correlation between these levels. And you might say, oh, there's a, there's a correlation here. So you might not think that these are orthogonal. Well, what makes them orthogonal in the Slameka experiment is the assignment of subjects to these conditions. So it's an experimental design, and it's the assignment of subjects to the conditions that produces an orthogonal set of independent variables. Subjects can be assigned in a confounded way that would make these things not orthogonal. Well, let's take a look at that. If you remember the lab assignment from the first week, what we did was imagined how to make a data frame where we could assign subjects to these different conditions. And here's that data frame. Um, so we could look at that uh, subject one, if they're, when they're in the original learning condition with two learning trials, 
for that one, they'll get assigned to an interpolated learning of zero. And if they're four, four, and eight, eight. So for subject one, actually, there is a correlation between original learning and interpolated learning. But for subject two, the pattern is different. It's four and zero, eight, four, two, and eight. So across subjects, the pattern between OL and IL is um, arranged in such a way that if we correlate it across subjects, the OL variable and the IL variable, we should get zero correlation. So let's do that. We can run a correlation. And what we can see is each of the columns, so subjects, OL and IL, are correlated perfectly with themselves, but they have zero correlation with all of the other columns. So because of how subjects were assigned, uh, the independent variables of OL and IL are orthogonal because there's zero correlation. If you wanted to confound the design, you could. And I mean, this would not be a very good experiment, but it's worth considering what you would have to do to make it confounded. For example, let's check this uh, confounded design out. And what did I do here? Let's see. I changed something to 48048. Ah, this is what I did. I wanted to confound the IL variable with the OL variable. So, for subject one, that already was occurring in the previous data frame. The lowest level of IL is paired with the lowest level of OL. Same, the middle levels paired with each other and the big levels paired with each other. Now look what, for subject two, it's the same thing. Two goes with zero, four goes with four, eight goes with eight. And for subject three, same thing. Two goes with zero, four goes with four, eight goes with eight. So this means that if you assign subjects like this um, and you showed some difference, you wouldn't know if it was increases in OL or increases in IL because both of those things are increasing for everybody. Uh, if we were to correlate this design, what we would see is that there is now a big correlation between the OL learning column and the IL learning column. So they're non-orthogonal, so they're confounded. All right. Um, yeah, let's take a moment to connect some of this issue to the next one we'll, where we'll be talking about semi-partial correlation. If you ran a confounded design like this and you found that um, there was some difference in your measurement, you wouldn't be able to know how much of that difference was caused by the original learning variable or the interpolated learning variable because they're both correlated with each other. And there's some different possibilities. It could be that um, the thing that's causing a difference is just the part of, of this that's due to original learning or your first variable. It could be um, that it's just the second thing that's doing something. Or it could be a little bit of both. A little bit of both of those things might be working. And um, this is often possible. Um, the thing you're measuring can be multiply determined. So multiple things might be predictive of the variation in the thing you're measuring. So let's consider that notion as we head over to semi-partial correlation. All right, let's flip over to the textbook. Here's a textbook example uh, that we use to think about semi-partial correlation. So this is some sample data from a fictitious replication of an experiment. The idea was that the ability for kids to remember stuff measured by their memory span, how many words they could recall, is going to be influenced by um, how old they are and how fast they can talk. Potentially, if you could talk faster, you know, you could rehearse words more in your rehearsal buffer. 
So the more words you can rehearse faster, potentially the more words you could remember, let's say. And uh, this is not something you can really run an experiment on. You can't randomly assign children to be different ages. You can't take the same person and make them be different ages, and you can't take that person and make them have different speech rates. So you cannot manipulate either of these two variables that might be causally related in some sense to memory span. Um, so, you know, you can't run the experiment, but you can still measure memory span in a bunch of different individuals and you can note their ages and you can, you know, measure their speech rate. And I guess you could sort of try to correlate these things together and, and ask. Um, so I know I noticed that certain kids have lower memory spans and certain kids have higher memory spans. And, you know, does this pattern, this variation in memory span, is it explained by variation in age or variation in speech rate? That's That might be some kind of question that you could ask. And one of the issues here is that the variables themselves are not independent. So, um, you know, if, if you were to say, uh, it's, it, it's, un, it's unclear really, um, if age is explaining some of this, or if uh, speech rate is explaining some of this, or something about the correlation between these two things are explaining this. Actually, I'm just gonna jump down to the end of this chapter because there's a really nice Venn diagram that is helpful to think about when we think about this issue. And so we might admit that if two things are correlated, so X and T, X is age and T is speech rate. If those two things are correlated with each other, then we might be considering three separate sources of variance that might explain some other variable like memory span. So we might have the variance that's just due to age and we might have the variance that's just due to speech rate. And then there's this idea of shared variance. It's the part of age and speech rate that correlate with each other. So there's these three things, the part of age that is unique, that does not correlate with speech rate. The part of age that correlates with speech rate and the part of speech rate that's unique to speech rate and doesn't correlate with age. How can we get this stuff? That's what semi-partial correlation is all about. Thinking about how to um, decorrelate two variables and measure a unique part for X, a unique part for T, and a shared part and see how those three different things might explain memory span. So let's do that. Here's the example from the textbook. I just put those very same numbers into a tibble and we can run the model here. So, um, yeah, we're going to do a multiple regression explaining y as a function of x and t. So there we have it. Let's also look at the correlations and the r squared values. So I've just taken that data frame, which has our x, t, and y. Remember, x is age, t is speech rate, y is memory span. We're predicting y as a function of both of these things. And like we were doing before, we're asking the question, well, how correlated is everything in the first place? So X is correlated with itself, and T is correlated with itself, and Y is correlated with itself perfectly. And these are correlations here, and these ones are R squared values. They're just the squared versions of these ones. So what we can see right away is that uh, X is correlated with T, 0.75. Um, and T is correlated with X. 
So T and X are not orthogonal. Remember X is age. If I remember, yeah, X is age. So does age correlate or explain variance in memory span? We could look at this value. This is the R squared between X and memory span Y. So it looks like yes, age does explain some of the variation in memory span. And we could say, well, how about speech rate? Does speech rate explain some of the variation in, in memory span? So let's look at T, that's for speech rate and memory span. So that's 0.97. Looks like speech rate explains even more of the variance. However, um, 0.64 and 0.97, if you add those together, you you get a number bigger than one. So if we're thinking about how X and T combine to explain variation in Y, what we found is that they explain 161% of the variation. Well, that's more variation than, than, there, than exists. So they've overfit the data. There's, you can only explain 100% of the variation. There is no giving 110% here. It stops at one. Now, the idea is that you're measuring something twice here. Um, Let me just go back to this Venn diagram. So when we're computing the correlation between X and Y, that's this whole circle. And we then square that and get our R squared. So it's however much is in that circle is, is a number. And we're gonna say, I think it was 0.67. Great, so 0 0.67, that's how much we explain of, of y. And then there's this other circle, and um, that's how much variation in t explains variation in y. And I think we got, what did we get? Uh, 0.64 for x and 0.97 for t, right? Now what you can see here is this circle represents 0.64, this one represents 0.97 or whatever. If we add those two things together, this part in the middle, we add that twice. So that's why we're getting something bigger than one. So what we want to do is um, re-express these two confounded variables into three sources of variation. The unique parts of each, so the unique part of x, the unique part of t, and the shared part. In order to do this, um, semi-partial correlation involves a process of decorrelation, which I call taking the line out of the data. So in order to accomplish the goal of finding out the part of X that is not correlated with T, we need to find out the part of X that is correlated with T and remove it. And if we did that, we'd decorrelate X and T. So fortunately, um, the very same tools we use to measure correlation with a line in linear regression produces uh, something uh, that we can use for our decorrelation de tool. So you might be wondering, well, how can we decorrelate or take the line out of our data? So here's what we're going to do. Let's take a look at this. Um, we're going to focus on the concept that residuals in a linear regression are decorrelated. So what do I mean by that? Let's take our data and Let's just focus on the possibility that age predicts some of the variation in memory span. Okay, so we run our linear regression. And um, what I'm going to do here is create a data frame that plots the residuals and the, the line. So remember, when we do our linear regression of um, 
explaining y in terms of x. Uh, we're going to create a line, and that line has these values, and there's these residuals, which is how far the data points fall from those from the line. So we can look at that uh, in a plot. So let's quickly do that. So I'm making three plots. And notice here, I've put the ggplots into different variables a, b, and c. And I'm going to use the patchwork library, which is wonderful. And it allows us to put three, three things together, three plots all in the same place. So let's take a look at this. Over here, we have the original data. So we're plotting x as a function of, or y as a function of x. So these are the data points. Um, remember, there is uh, two four-year-olds, and here they are. The two four-year-olds had these two memory spans. And there's uh, two seven-year-olds here and two ten-year-olds here. All right. So this is the regression line. Okay. And this regression line is, uh, you know, the, re the regression basically is defined by, one, this line being the best fit line. <laughs> and the best fit line is the one that minimizes the sum of the squared deviations, which is the parts between each data point and the line that are not explained by the line. So this line happens to minimize those ones. What I'm showing over here are the two pieces of that regression. So here's the line, and um, from the perspective of the line, these data points are supposed to fall on the line. So these fours, instead of having the value uh, 14 and 23, which is the actual value, you know, according to the line, those things should be right around here. So that's what this is showing you, where, where the dots should be on the line. It's just redrawing the line. These dots on the line should be right around here. So that's why we don't see two dots. It's just they're both following on this line. So this is thinking of the dots in terms of where they would fall on the regression line. And I've called this uh, the predicted values of x. You can use the predict function here. This is where I got it from. This is a nice feature of R. Um, what's going on here is if we run this linear regression and then we say just predict and you put inside of this the, the model that you made, it's going to give you back the predicted values of Y for each of the X values. So for each of the x values, it's the location on the line for, for the predicted y values. We're just plotting that. The other part is the residuals, right? So if you use the residuals function, you're going to get these values here. And in terms of these lines, um, how far off is this first dot from the line? Well, it's you know, if we looked at the number, so the first dot is this one, um, or actually, I was pointing to this this one here, which is above the line, so that's a 20-something. Uh, I think that's this guy, right? So this dot is actually a 23 in terms of how far up on Y it is. It's predicted to be a 19. The difference here is that it's three more than 19.9. That's the residual. That's this little missing piece. So the residuals are a plot of the missing pieces of the regression. Uh, as you can see, each of the residuals uh, are kind of random deviations from the line. Um, it should be clear that 
if we add up these two things, we get our original y value. So from the perspective of the x, we're saying our y value is a combo of its line part, where it is on the line, and the part that's not on the line, the part that's not predicted by the line, the residual error. Okay. Now, the important point here is if we think of, so we're, just to be clear, these are the Y scores that are composed of a line part and a off the line part. If we only plot the line part as we do in the middle graph, we see the line. Now, what happens if we plot the parts that are off the line, the errors? Guess what? We don't get any linear relationship. We get a slope of zero. There is no correlation now between the values of x and the residual error. So guess what? The very process of doing linear regression produces um, a way of thinking about the data that has a line part and a decorrelated part. So uh, we can make use of this to do semi-partial correlation. I'm just gonna show you this one more time. If we wanted to predict y here as a function of the other variable t, we could do that. So I'm just gonna repeat all the things I did before. So now we're predicting y from t. Remember, there is a much bigger correlation there. So the y values are, you know, they're closer to this line, really. Um, so the residuals overall are much smaller. The line does a better job of expanding explaining the variation here. And I've plotted the line and where the dots ought to fall on the line. And I've plotted the residual error, the little pieces that aren't on the line. And again, um, the residual error has zero correlation. So we could think of this um, residual error as a decorrelated, as a tool for decorrelation. You know, if we wanted to decorrelate uh, T and Y together, we could take these residual scores because we, had, we now have seen that um, these residual scores are the part of the scores that ha are not correlated, um, right? So let's use that for semi-partial correlation. Now we're gonna do the exact same thing that we've been doing in the last two examples, except now uh, we're going to look at X and T. These are our supposed independent variables that we know are correlated with each other. And what we wanna do is decorrelate X and T to find the unique part of X the unique part of T and the part of X and T that are po possibly related or shared. Now to do this, we just can run our linear regression, but predict, uh, sorry, we can replace our uh, Y variable uh, which is our dependent variable, with x and t. So we can either put x here and th explain x in terms of t, or we can put t here and explain t in terms of x. We can do both of those things. Let's try it this way. And now we're asking what part of x is unique to x and not correlated with t. So let's explain x as a function of t. These are the residuals. These values are the part of x that is not linearly correlated with t. Right, if we um, correlate um, 
these values with t, they will, there will be zero correlation. If we return to our original question, um, so one of those questions was, how much does age predict memory span? Well, instead of asking that question, we could remove the correlation between age and speech rate. And that would change these values of age. And, and to look at those new values that are only related to age and not shared with speech rate, we'd be looking for the residuals between X and T in that regression. That is these values here. These are the values that don't fall on that line. They're the values of age that are uncorrelated with speech rate. So if we wanted to ask the question, well, how much does age alone explain variation in memory span? We could correlate the residuals from this regression between X and T and correlate those with our dependent variable and square them. And I did that and we get 0 0.0085. If we look at this little Venn diagram, we've found the variance specific to X and how much it predicts Y, 0 0.0085. So we could play the same game, finding the unique part of T, but now we're explaining variation in T as a function of variation in X. And this gives us different residuals. Instead of saying, how much does T explain variation in Y? Well, what we're doing here is removing the part of T that's correlated with X. And we're thinking about the leftover part of T that's not correlated. That's these residuals here. That's this part of the Venn diagram. And we want to know how much variation that explains in terms of our dependent variable. So we could use those residuals here to correlate those with our dependent variable, and we get 0.34. So the shared part, um, we can do a little bit of algebra here. We could say that, um, well, if we go right back to the beginning, where we tried to explain variation in Y or memory span with both of our independent variables, remember both of those together explained, we got a multiple R squared here, 0.9866. So we're going to think about that as the total amount of explained variance. And what we've done is, um, so I can get that number here. I've saved that. So we got a 0.98. So let's subtract from that the R squared that's just due to X, the unique part of X, which we found to be 0 0.0085. And let's subtract also the part that's uniquely t, the 0.34. So if we do that, it'd be like saying, let's subtract this part of the circle. Let's subtract that part of that circle. What's left here? That's gonna be the common variation between x and t. So we could say that's 0.63. Um, I'm going to end this section with, with a bit of a question about what we've <laughs> succeeded in exp explaining here. And I think it's, it's, um, it's a difficult question. Uh, we, we wanted to know in the first place the extent to which age and speech rate might explain uh, variation in um, memory span. And in some sense, um, it's, yeah, it's just not clear what we've explained because this part over here is the part that is uniquely due to age. And we can see that this didn't ver explain very much. This part over here 
is the part that's uniquely due to speech rate. And it explained 0.34, so not as much as the, the shared variance. And in some sense, like the shared variance is hard to interpret. It's the part of the variation that's not due to age or speech rate. So what is this thing? It's explaining most of the variance, but it's hard to know what it is. Um, so semi-partial correlation is an interesting technique for taking lines out of data. Um, it allows us to assign different pieces of our variables, different amounts of explanation as a function of how we partition these things. Uh, depending on your research design though, it, it may or may not help you uh, explain the thing you're trying to explain at a higher theoretical level. Not sure if that all came together, but something to think about. So in the last section here, I just wanna show you that you can do semi-partial correlation pretty quickly with the PP core package. So here is the PP core package. Here's the original data. And uh, if you run SP core, that's the semi partial correlation function here. You get a bunch of things. And um, just wanted to note that the SP core function returns correlations in terms of R values. If you wanted to get R squared, you'd have to square those values. So here, if we do this, we should see some of the values that we'd found before. For example, um, what is the semi-partial correlation between X and Y? That is the part of X that is unique to X. There it is, 0 0.0085, we found that one before. How about T and Y? Well, here is the correlation between T and Y with that is unique to T. So here we found some of those semi-partial correlations we were looking for and you just have to know kind of how to interpret this table. All right, that is all for this video and we'll see you next time for the, our first lab on ANOVA.